And everybody said, Amen. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us to our Bible study. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the godliness that comes into our lives as we study your word. We pray, Lord, today, as your word comes, transform every life by the word in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us, Lord, as we know the truth, that the truth will make us triumphant in life. Make us new creatures, new believers, transformed believers. Let the purpose of the study of your word be reflected in every life in Jesus' name. But thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're going on and continuing with our study of the epistle of James. General epistle to all the believers everywhere. To you, to me, and to everyone. Today we come to chapter 1, verse 17. In verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Verse 18. In verse 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 19, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man, everyone, every believer be sweet to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Then in verse 20, in verse 20, for the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. The wrath of man, the indignation of man, the anger of man, the fury of man, however small, however packaged, however manifested, the wrath, the anger, the indignation of man, of a woman, of course, of any human being. The wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. In verse 21, it says, Wherefore, lay apart. You wake up in the morning, you have your devotion, you're going into life. You're going into the office, you're going into the marketplace. There's something you check up. Any kind of filthiness, all of them lay aside. And the superfluity of naughtiness, what comes naturally. You don't have to be prayerful to be naughty. You don't have to be spiritual to be naughty. You don't, have to, you don't need self-denial to be naughty. Just the natural, depraved man. As man is born into the world, is born with depravity and naughtiness. And as we grow in life, that naughtiness overflows. And it says, if we're going to be beloved brethren, children of God, here is what to lay aside. We lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness so that we can receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Then in verse 22, it says, but be ye doers 
of the word not just hearers be ye doers of the word not just preachers like i preach i'm not just to preach the word i am to obey the word and do the word be ye doers of the word and not hearers only not proclaimers only not preachers only deceiving your own selves tonight we're looking at the ministry of god's word in heaven watch believers there are many believers in court there are worldly believers in court there are sinful backsliding believers in court there are stagnant believers in course there are the backward looking believers in course there are worldly earthly sensual believers in course but for the people who are heaven watch who study the word with a purpose who follow after the lord for a purpose who seek the lord for a purpose their purpose is to get to heaven and they are referred to as heavenward believers. And now, the ministry of the word, of God's word, is such heavenward believers. There are three things we are looking at as we consider the passage. Number one, the perfect gifts from the Father by the word. He gives us gift, every perfect gift. Coming from the Father, with whom there is no shadow of variableness, nor any kind of turning. Number one, the perfect gifts from the Father by the Word. Number two, the profitable graciousness as the first fruits through the Word. When we hear the Word, it turns our lives around. It makes us converted and committed to the Lord and it brings forth the fruit and we become, we ourselves, we become the first fruits for, from the word, by the word and through the word. Number three, our practical godliness, the theoretical godliness, the one that professes I am and they are not. The one that knows the theory of following after the Lord, but his own theory. They can recite the word. They can coach the word. They can throw the word at you, but it doesn't have a revealing, reflecting power in their lives. But the godliness that is practical, you can see it. You can examine it and you can see that this godliness is not just the profession of the mouth. It's not theory. It's not history. I knew the Lord 20 whatever, 19 whatever. But when you look for the result of knowing the Lord, the practical evidence and the spiritual scriptural essence of knowing the lord you cannot find out but that the practical one number three our practical godliness in faithfulness to the word let's come to number one number one we're looking at perfect gifts from the father by the word in james chapter 1 verse 17 every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down it came down at the time of the apostles it's still coming down today it will keep coming down until we see the lord face to face cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning verse 18 in verse 18 of his own will begat ye us by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures three things we're looking at number one is the precious gift of salvation 
for sonship. Number two, the purifying gift of sanctification and steadfastness. Number three, the power, powerful gift or powerful gifts in the plural of the spirit for service. Look at number one, number one, the precious gift of salvation for sonship. Salvation is a gift. It's not something you earn. It's not something you work for. It's not something you marriage. It's not something you strive to attain. It's a gift that you obtain. It tells us in John chapter 1, reading from verse 12, John 1 verse 12, but as many as received him, they don't receive a denomination. They don't receive an ideology. They don't receive just the doctrine. They receive him, the Savior, to them. He gave power, privilege to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Verse 13, in verse 13, which were born, born again which were born, born anew, which were born not of blood, no, of the will of the flesh, but no, of the will of, of man, but of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 8, Ephesians 2 verse 8, for by grace, not by works, by grace are you saved through faith, and that salvation not of yourself, not something you earn, not something you work religiously to have, not something that your natural talents, your natural gift, and your natural activity and ability gives you. It says that salvation is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, salvation. The gift of God, forgiveness, freedom, redemption, adoption into the family of God. Everything that's still salvation, everything comes at the gift of God. And then in verse 9, it says, not of words, lest any man should boast. And then in verse 10, it says, for we who are saved, we who are born again, we who have received that gift of salvation, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works as a result of the salvation. As long as the salvation abides, then we manifest good works. It says good works which God as before ordained that we should walk in them titus chapter 2 reading from verse 11 for the grace that bring of god that bringeth salvation has appeared to all available for all provided for all and everyone is invited to have that grace gift of salvation. Verse 12, it says, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. Frivolity gets out when grace comes in. Foolishness, foolish talk, foolish attitude. Foolish behavior gets out when the grace of God comes in. And that grace of God teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and ungodly in this present world. Verse 13, it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. But Fortino gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all 
iniquity. The small ones, he redeems us from all iniquity. The common ones, everybody does it. Everybody in a street, everybody in a community, that's what everybody does. But he redeems us from common iniquity, habitual iniquity. That's what you've been doing since you came to this world. And that's what you picked up from other people. You learn from other people. You collect from other people. All those collected iniquities, everything vanishes away. It says to redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Look at number two here. Number two is the purifying gift. It says every good gift, perfect gift comes from the Father. And here is another gift, the purifying gift of sanctification and steadfastness. John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The reason the word is given to us is to so dig deep into our nature and remove the depravity, the naturalness of going astray, sanctify them, purify them, purge them, circumcise them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Look at verse 20. In verse 20 it says, Neither pray I for these alone. Sanctification is not just for the early disciples, early apostles. He said, I'm not just praying for these in my presence, but for them also who shall believe on me through their word. Matthew was there. Through your reading of Matthew. And John was there through the reading of John. And all those apostles were there through what they will write and give unto us. Giving us the New Testament, the New Covenant. It says, I'm praying for all of them also which shall believe on me through their word. Verse 21, that they all may be one. Sanctification doesn't scatter believers, it gathers believers. Sanctification does not divide believers, it unites believers. Sanctification does not bring conflict and diversion and destruction among believers. It brings life brings unity, brings fellowship, and brings love. It says, I'm praying for this gift of sanctification to be given unto them that they all may be one. Anywhere you see this unity, there's no sanctification there. Either A is sanctified, B is not sanctified, and A and B are trying to struggle and B is struggling for position and power and recognition, but A is struggling to keep his sanctification. Anywhere there is division, anywhere there is disunity, anywhere there is conflict, anywhere there is fighting against one another, that they are in a man struggling for recognition, therefore they collide. There's no sanctification there. And if Christ comes and meets all those so-called believers in their kind of conflict and disunity, fighting not for the faith, but they're fighting for whatever it is they're struggling for, if Christ comes and meets them in that condition, they will not get to heaven if the Bible is true. And the Bible is true that without holiness, no man, no one 
shall see the Lord. It says, sanctify them. And I pray for them. I pray for these, but not for them alone. I pray for everyone that will believe on me through their words, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. When believers are in conflict, the world will not believe. Oh, they say they're just like us. We fight, they fight, we compete with ourselves, they compete with themselves. We annoy ourselves. We disregard ourselves. They disregard themselves too. We fight against our leaders in the nation. They fight against their leader too in the church. We're all the same. Why are they calling me to believe? What has the faith and the believing? What has it done in them? But when we believe and we are saved, when we believe and we are sanctified and we are one, and everybody can see that practical oneness, it says that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 22. In verse 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. Verse 23, in verse 23, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Ephesians chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 13, sorry. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 12. In Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people the people already saved and born again with his own blood is suffered without the gate. What do we do? Verse 13, it says, Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. There will be reproach, there might be insult, there might be assault. There might be defamation. There might be belittling of your personality. But uh, you don't abandon the cross. You don't abandon Christ because of that. It says we go to him. For him to sanctify us. Even with all the reproach and with all the insult and with all the assault. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the calm. Bearing his reproach verse 14 for here have we no continuing city but we seek one to come first thessalonians chapter 5 we're reading from verse 22 abstain from all appearance of evil abstain get rid of that avoid don't get near that. It appears to be evil. Maybe it's not completely, completely evil. But the people who see you will interpret it to be evil. The people who hear of your action will judge that action to be evil. The people on the receiving side who get the result of your action, they'll say, as evil, maybe you didn't judge it to be evil. The people on the receiving end of your action, they judge it to be evil 
abstain from all appearance of evil. Look at 23 there, in verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, totally, completely, entirely. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 26, he gave himself for the church that he, Christ, might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present that church to himself, a glorious church. Sanctification makes the church a glorious church. The people who do not desire sanctification, pray for sanctification, deny themselves so we can all be sanctified. The people who do not pursue the possession of sanctification, they don't want the church to be glorious. They want the church to be grounded. They want the church to be at the back. They want the church, this church, to be like every other church. They want the church to retain some of its depravity. But the people who want the church to be glorious, who want the church to be without spot, without wrinkle. Those are the people that consecrate. Those are the people that pray unto the Lord that they may be sanctified as other members too are sanctified, that he might present it to himself. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of thing, but that it should be holy. That the church should be holy. That every member, young and old, should be holy. That every member, men and women, should be holy. That all the church, the members, the ministers, the workers, the preachers, the pastors, that everyone should be holy. That the church, that every family in the church should be holy. That's what Jesus died for. That's what Jesus has provided. And when we pray, he will do it. But that it should be holy and without blemish. Look at number three here. Number three is the powerful gift or the powerful gifts of the Spirit for service. Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 4. Acts 1 verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them, he didn't advise them, commanded them, he didn't, you know, ask them, what do you think about this? Commanded them that they should not Depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, ye have heard of me. Verse 5, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8, in verse 8, but he shall receive power. That the gift of God, he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea 
and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Well then, unto the uttermost part of the earth beyond Jerusalem, beyond the first century until the end of the world that we need to be evangelizing and preaching the gospel. We need the power. We need the gift. The powerful gift of the Spirit for service. Look at chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 33. Acts 2, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Verse 38. Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39. For the promise is unto you, unto the people there present, and unto your children, unto their children, biological, unto their spiritual children too. Their converse. And it says, and unto them that are far off, far away from Jerusalem, far away from the first century, unto them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. In First Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, gifts of the Spirit, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Look at verse uh, look at uh, verse 7 there. In verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with us. Verse 8, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, and to another the word of knowledge. By the same Spirit, verse 9, in verse 9, and to another faith, the gift of faith by the same spirit and to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit verse 10 in verse 10 to another the working of miracles and to another prophecy and to another discerning of spirits and to another diverse kinds of tongues and to another the interpretation of tongues in verse 11 it says and all these all these gifts all these gifts of the spirit worketh that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will as he will Luke chapter 11 verse 13 in Luke 11 13 if ye then being evil natural people if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children how much more Shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? The gift of salvation is from the Father. The gift of sanctification from the Father. And the gifts of the Spirit from the Father ask and shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you for everyone that asketh receiveth he that seeketh findeth and to him that knocketh it shall be opened unto him he'll give you the appropriate gifts in Jesus name
salvation available for everyone sanctification available for everyone amen, amen. the baptism in the holy ghost available for everyone in jesus name amen. look at point number two here point number two we're looking at a profitable uh, uh, graciousness as first fruits through the word. The word gives us a lot. It tells us in James chapter 1, verse 19. James 1, 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man, everyone, every brother, every sister, every member of the church, every worker in the church, every pastor in the church, every leader, everyone. The word of God speaks to everyone. It's not speaking to them and leaving us out. When we're saved, we take our place with all the children of God. And when the word of God comes, we don't separate ourselves isolate ourselves we don't promote ourselves to a self-made throne where the word cannot reach us speaks to everyone let every man be sweet to hear slow to speak slow to wrath verse 20 in verse 20 for the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. Verse 21. In verse 21, wherefore lay apart all filthiness, filthiness of every size, of every shape, filthiness as you see in the society, filthiness as you see in the secret, filthiness. Whether man can see or man cannot see. Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Superfluity of naughtiness. There shouldn't even be any naughtiness at all. Not to talk of superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness where there is pride. We cannot receive the word of God. Where there is invested interest in filthiness, we will not be able to receive the word of God. Where there is naughtiness, headiness, stubbornness, stony heart, we will be fighting against the word of God, arguing and debating in our heart. We will not be able to receive the word of God with meekness, but we lay all that aside so that we can receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Look at three things here. Number one, renewing the ennobling wonders of sweet hearing and slow speaking. Number two, renouncing the ensnaring works with sinners superfluity. Number three, retaining the engrafted word for sustained salvation. Look at number one. Number one, renewing the ennobling wonders of sweet, a swift hearing and slow speaking. We're looking at James chapter 1, verse 19. In James chapter 1, verse 19, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every beloved brother, every beloved sister, Every candidate for heaven, let every man be sweet to hear, 
slow to speak, slow to wrath. What brings division in the church? Being swift to speak, swift to hear, and to switch to wrath and slow to hear. What brings division in the family? What brings separation in the family? What brings tearing apart in the family? What brings divorce in the family? Because each of them, man, woman, woman, one, they are sweet and too fast to get angry. When they interpret each other's action, and they're too fast to speak. And the words they speak, they're like daggers in the hearts of people. And they're slow to listen, slow to hear one another. What brings division, conflict, protests in a nation? When the, you know, this side, they're, they're slow to hear or talk. We shout, we cry, we're hungry, and they're slow to hear, and they just carry on, governors as they should. And then the other side too, they switch to wrath and to get angry and to say, we'll pull everything down. I see pulling everything down will bring the food we're asking for. If we're going to have peace in the church, in the family, in the community, my beloved brethren, husbands and wives, members of the church, and members of society, let every man be sweet to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. It tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, reading from verse 2. Ecclesiastes 5, 2. Be not rash with thy mouth. Let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou Upon earth, therefore, let thy words be few. As we come to the sanctuary, as we come to the house of God, let your hands rest, let your feet rest, let your eyes look on, let your ears be open to the word of God. Be not too hasty. To do this, do that. Be not too hasty to act out this and act out that. Let's see the peace of God in you. The quietness, the serenity, and the respect and the honor we have for God in his house. Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. We're looking at number two here. Number two is the renouncing of ensnaring works for sinners superfluity. Normally, sinners have their filthiness and they have their naughtiness. If sinners did not have naughtiness, there would be no need for salvation. They need salvation because of their naughtiness. But when the sinner's naughtiness flows into so-called believers, and as teachers find it difficult to teach in their classrooms, the preachers have the same difficulty teaching the word of God in the church. That's bad. That's evil. But he wants us to renounce all those ensnaring works 
of the sinner's superfluity. We're looking at James chapter 1, reading from verse 20. For the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. The wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God in sinners when he crusade. And, you know, somebody there is angry. Another person there is angry. And the workers are angry. And the pastor, the evangelist, the preacher, looking at this, and that also gets angry. And we begin to speak words of anger, indignation, wrath. And the sinners are there, and they came for salvation. They won't get saved. The pastor is fighting, the evangelist is fighting, the workers are fighting, and the people who handle whatever, they are all fighting, they are brass. Uh, there, there's no salvation for the sinners that come there. Let the people go back home and let them go and repent and have real salvation that wrath and anger will be totally taken off. But the preachers are angry and the singers are angry and everybody is full of wrath and we're dishing out our wrath on the people. Nobody gets saved. It's a waste of our time. Why are we wasting our time? Let's go back to the cross. Go back to Calvary because the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. In verse 21, that's why it now says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. It tells us in First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 1. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, for us to be in good relationship with God, we lay aside all malice. For us to be fit for the service of God and the least of service in the house of God and for God to recognize that, that we are serving him, we have to lay aside all malice. For us to be of any benefit to, to the local church, for us to be of any benefit to the church at large, the church worldwide. For us to be of any benefit to the people we are sending the message to, we need to lay aside all malice. What's malice? Because something had happened between you and him, between you and her, there is sadness. That sadness goes to grief. That grief goes to anger. That anger becomes settled. That because of what he did to me, because of what he did to my wife, to what he did to my husband, what he did to my fellow brother, my fellow sister, because of what he did to that other worker. He didn't do it to me, but I see he did it to them. We have settled anger. That's malice. And it says when we come before the Lord, and if you are before the Lord all the time, in your morning devotion, in your family devotion, anywhere you are, if you are before the Lord every time, you lay aside permanently all malice, all guile, all hypocrisies, all envies, and all evil speaking. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain, abstain, 
abstain if you are born again abstain if you're a true brother a true sister abstain if you're a candidate for heaven abstain abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul he wants us to get rich of all those things. Look at number three here now. Number three, we're looking at retaining the engrafted word for sustained salvation. Retaining the engrafted word for sustained salvation. It tells us in James chapter 1, verse 21, the latter part, and receive. With meekness, we cannot receive the word with pride, with a kind of elevated opinion of ourselves. When we're thinking of ourselves all the time and thinking of our self-esteem all the time and thinking of, of thinking of our high position all the time, when we come to the house of God, the presence of God levels everyone and we bow and bench before the Lord and all we can have is loneliness of mind and meekness and we receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls and that is what brings fruit in us and through us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not at the word of men. Hold on there. There are people nowadays, sorry to say, and sorry to know this, that when they refer to the Apostle Paul, some of them, they just say, Brother Paul. That's bad enough. Sometimes they go beyond that. They say, Paul. Paul said, then they say, but you must not take all the words of Paul seriously. You must understand, Paul was a man like I was. No, sir. The Lord said he will reveal unsearchable mystery unto him. He has not promised any of us here. He will reveal a searchable mystery to us. Paul the Apostle said, By the grace of God, I am what I am. And the grace that was bestowed on me made him to do more than all the other apostles put together. And when he rebuked Peter, with the word, Peter did not come around to say, Who are you, Paul? Peter recognized him. That man had authority. This is a man that had gone to the third heavens and to come back. And then some people are now telling us that, you know, that's Paul. What he said, they cannot receive because it's the word of a man. And they say, he made mistakes. I pray that God will open their eyes. They're contradicting the Bible, the word of God. Here we come, the Thessalonians, when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, of us, Paul and the others, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. If you listen to those preachers, 
it shall bring doubt in your mind. You read something here, and if that thing is difficult to practice naturally, and you need prayer, you need self-denial, you need the grace of God, before you can practice that thing, you just give up. It's the word of Paul. Everything is the word of God. I said everything is the word of God. What you read in Genesis, is it the word of Moses? Is it the word of Moses? What you read in Joshua, is it the word of Joshua? What you read in Matthew, is it the word of Matthew? And what you read in the epistle to the Romans, is it the words of Paul? Have you gone back home? Are you offended? I said what you read in John. Is it the words of John? No. Everything we read in the Bible, in the word of God, is the word of God. And Jesus said, any man that will take away from the word of this prophecy is part of be taken out of the book of life. Anyone that will add to this word, God will add unto him the plagues that are reaching therein. Be very careful you are not swept off your feet by these people who are now picking and choosing the ones they accept that the word of God, the one they don't accept that knocks them and calls them to repentance. They say the word of man. It says, for this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Welcome to point number three now. Point number three is our practical godliness in faithfulness to the word. Faithfulness to the word. If we're going to be faithful to God, we have not seen God face to face, but we have his word. Faithfulness to God demands faithfulness to his word. Faithfulness to God demands faithfulness to his servants that he sent. And his servants who are telling us the totality and completeness of the word of God without subtraction, without addition. Faithfulness of God demands that everything we hear, everything we learn from the word of God that tells us to pray and be saved, pray and be restored, pray and be sanctified, pray and be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Faithfulness to God demands we are faithful to that call, we are faithful to that demand, we are faithful to that consecration, devotion unto the Lord. Our practical godliness in faithfulness to the word. It says in James chapter 1 verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Be ye doers of the word and not preachers only, deceiving your own selves. Are there preachers who preach, give tithes and offering, and they never give any tithe and offering? Preachers, not doers. Are there preachers who tell us that you know, you and your wife, you and your husband shall stay together until death do you part. But those preachers, for whatever reason or the other, they send their wives to her mother. Go and stay there. Give me time to breathe. I want to, you know, have my life. But you preacher, you tell congregation, stay together 
but you cannot stay together. They are preachers of the word. They are not doers of the word. Are there preachers that will discipline a member of the church? If a member of the church puts his hand in the offering bag and takes money to go and spend on his soul, and the same preacher will not take the money to the place, to the bank where it belongs, and then uh, before anything is counted, the preacher takes the money. I need money for this and money for that. You know what the word of God says? Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, and not preachers only. And the members of the church that come every time, we hear the word, we learn the word, we read the word. But as much as what we read and what we hear, how much are we doing? He wants us not to deceive ourselves, not to delude ourselves, and not to a kind of fool ourselves, thinking we're going to heaven when all we have is hearing the word, hearing the word, and not doing the word. You know, somebody comes to our church here for one whole year and is not born again. Does a see not be hearing? We shall be born again almost every time. Be ye doers of the word. Get born again, not hearers only. And there are people here that hear about holiness, holiness, sanctification is the will of God. And yet we find unsanctified attitude, unsanctified life in the life of that person. Hearing and hearing, be ye doers of the world, not hearers only. Are there people that say here, husbands love your wives as Christ also loved the church? And the home is like a military cantonment. So many laws, so many rules, and so many pressure, and so much wickedness in the home, oppressing each other. They are hearers of the word, they are not doers. And they are deceiving themselves because they think they are going to heaven. It's the doers of the word that get to heaven. And it says, but be ye doers of the word word and not hear us only deceiving your own selves. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, the doers of the word in all sincerity. They're sincere, they're honest with themselves and with their neighbors. The doers of the word in all sincerity. Number two, the deceivers in their waywardness without salvation. Number three, the disciples committed to the word of the scripture. Look at number one. Number one, the doers of the word in all sincerity. It tells us in Romans chapter 6, reading here from verse 17. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin. Past tense, ye were no more. Ye were the servants of sin. But, but now, ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now, when the grace of God came in and when you heard the word of God, you are now doers of the word. And you do that from the heart. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. May it be fulfilled in all our lives in Jesus' name. I come into number two here. Number two, the deceivers in their waywardness without salvation. It tells us in Matthew chapter 7. 
reading from verse 21, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Understand, there are two places in eternity, not three, two. One is heaven, the other is hell. Those who are not in heaven will be in hell forever and ever. And it says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. Well, the people that say, Lord, Lord, preachers, members of churches, religious people, those who pray, those who fast, those who have, in quote, ministry, those who oversee assemblies, Lord, Lord, those who have public ministry, Lord, Lord, those who evangelize, Lord, Lord, those who carry the label of the name of a denomination, Lord, Lord, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth, doeth of the word, he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, many will say to me in that day, the day of entering finally the kingdom of heaven. It says many, not few, not some, many, many people who are popular, maybe like me, in congregations, they are adored by their congregation. They are respected by their congregation. And they even go beyond their, their, their congregation, their denomination. They are respected outside. Because what do outside know, outside people know? What do they know about me? All they know is what they hear on the pulpit. Do they know my private life? Do we know their private lives? How much do we know of those people we see in the public? Either we we'll see them on the net or we'll see them in social media. All we can tell is the wheelchair that goes up, somebody has been healed. All we can tell is the person that says, I was blind, now I can see. And those people become popular. And the more popular they become, the more proud they become. And their pride can even push down the Lord and exalt themselves and they can count their own word superior to the word of the Bible that's where downfall comes when a preacher exalts his own idea his own word above the word of God and miracles are still happening look at this many will say to me that day Lord, Lord have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. Verse 23, it says, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in equity. Depart from me, Balaam, whose eyes are opened, and who can see all the trans, and who can prophesy of Christ to come. Yet, privately, he taught Balak to introduce the women of Moab to the children of Israel in a corner behind so that they will commit immorality and perish. Balaam prophesied 
Yet, the Lord was not pleased with him. Judas Iscariot, when he went out two by two, he also went out. And there was no failure, just like the others cast out devil. Judas cast out devil. Have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. Where you see now. It's not just miracle. It's not just healing. It's not just deliverance. It's being saved and living that safe life at home, on the street, in the church, privately and publicly. It's not just saying I'm sanctified or preaching sanctification. It's practicing, living in that godliness and sanctification everywhere you find yourself. That's the way to heaven and praise God you'll get there in Jesus' name. We're coming to number three here. Number three, and the disciples committed to the word of the scripture. Disciples who are committed to the word of God. It tells us in John chapter 8 verse 31. In John chapter 8 verse 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if he continue in my word, if he continue in the word of repentance, You've missed your step. You've done something you really shouldn't have done if you continue in the word of repentance. You've, uh, you know, maybe mistakenly or maybe deliberately, you've taken something belonging to other people. Money, property, whatever. And now you discover. And you know Christ can come at any time. If you continue in my word of restitution. You've discovered that your habit of late is, you know, going back. The righteousness of faith, the righteousness of the faithful, is no more reflected in your life. And you see that we need to have this righteousness, except your righteousness shall exceed. Except your righteousness, me, you, you, everyone, accept your righteousness. The righteousness you profess, accept that righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Outward righteousness. Ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. And he says, we continue in that word of righteousness. All the commandments he gave, all the word he gave. And he makes grace available that we seek his grace. And we seek his goodness. And we seek his godliness. And we follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man of whatever profession, no man of any religious height, without that holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And he says, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. I pray every one of us will continue in his word in Jesus' name. And where we'll become slack or careless, we'll go back to Christ, go back to the cross, go back to Calvary and kind of readjust our luggage, rearrange our lives and have the blood of the Lamb cleanse us, purge us, purify us and make us ready for the coming of the Lord. I pray none of us will receive the word of God in vain in Jesus name that the word will work effectually in every hearer let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer we've heard quite a lot tonight of the word of God and we receive that word at the word of God in deed and in truth open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I know
every good gift salvation comes from the father of lights when you come out of darkness and come out of shady shady things and you come to the light you come to christ the light of the world and you reveal everything in your life to him and say lord i see this i see this i see this forgive me cleanse me wash me touch me and i shall be as white as snow touch me again and i shall be whiter than snow tell the lord salvation is a gift when that gift comes in it transforms our lives and changes us through and through tell him if you discover backsliding talk to him merciful god he'll restore you he'll wash you and the sin that made you to backslide he will take away and he will take the love for sin take that away from your heart the desire for sin he'll take that away from your life the liking of the pleasure of sin he'll take that pleasure of sin away you'll not have pleasure in sin or sinfulness anymore the gift of salvation You've been hearing about sanctification and holiness for such a long time now. Have you ever set time apart? Looking at the condition of your heart, at the naughtiness in the heart, and looking at the incorrigibility in the heart. Have you thought so much about heaven and know that that naughtiness, stiff neck, stubbornness, rigidity, rebellion will not get to heaven? Are you serious about heaven? And do you go to God? And seek his face when we are sanctified. All those appearances of evil will be cleansed of. There will be no attachment of any appearance of evil in your heart anymore. And you will not be playing the religion of outward righteousness if my friends my neighbors my acquaintances if they don't see it then i'm good enough no god sees it he knows the heart he knows your thoughts in us your inward plan in us the inward depravity in us the naughtiness and in us the superfluity overflowing naughtiness Can't you see the flood of naughtiness on the ground? Everywhere you are, everywhere you act, everywhere you are allowed to bring out your behavior, don't you see the flood? of that dirty water 
of rebellion, disobedience, naughtiness on the ground. Why don't you tell the Lord this careless life, careless behavior, superfluity of naughtiness, for God to wash them off? You have had enough, you know enough. In this church, you know what sin is. You know what disobedience is. You know what depravity is. You know what naughtiness is. And you know the superfluity that flows out every time. And everybody can see. When are you going to prepare for heaven? Seek the Lord. Salvation. Sanctification. And the gift of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Renounce all those ensnaring works of the sinner's character, sinner's superfluity, sinner's gambling with their soul. And receive the nobling works, wonders of his suppression in your life. And retain the engrafted word. All that you have heard, retain. Retain. Renew your life. Let the blood wash you, cleanse you, purge you, purify you, renew you, revive you, and renounce and lay apart all the superfluity of disobedience. Be it doers of the word, in all sincerity, doers of the word. Do it. If you have grace, you will do it. If you have a heart for God, you will do it. Do it. Be doers of the word, not preachers only, not proclaimers only, not counselors only, be doers of the word, not Hear us only. Hear us only. Deceive themselves. Preachers only. Deceive themselves. Proud preachers who take liberty to put down the apostles of the New Testament and to search themselves up. 
higher now the apostles of the Lord they deceive themselves pastors general superintendents general overseers state overseers region overseers any kind of overseer exalting his position above the word of God rating their own word above the word of God they deceive themselves they arrogate to themselves the authority Christ has not given them they take their own revelation above the revelation of the word of truth self-deluded people don't deceive yourself the word of God is above everyone above every preacher above every pioneer above every pastor above any contemporary one a pride is lifting up be a true disciple be a true follower Give yourself wholly to the world. Commit yourself completely to the world. Commit yourself wholeheartedly, without reservation, to the word of Scripture. If you continue in my word of repentance, restitution, righteousness, my word of revelation, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth make you free in Jesus name we pray yeah. Heavenly Father we thank you for your faithfulness we well, thank you for the word you have sent to everyone. We are praying that this word will profit everyone who has heard in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray we will not bite the finger that feeds us. Amen. You feed us with the totality of the word. Amen. We pray we will honor you. We will respect your word. We we'll receive everything you send by your word in Jesus' name. Lord, we we'll pray everyone will receive more of your grace today in Jesus' name. More godliness, more holiness, give every one of us. And we we'll pray, Lord, that that godliness and the goodness of God shine forth in a bright way in our lives, everywhere we go, in Jesus' name. Amen. Separate us from the people that are so proud, they trample on your word, they trample on the apostles of the Bible, they trample on your revelation, your mystery. Separate us from them in Jesus' name. 
your people are candidates for heaven and nothing will take heaven from any of us in Jesus name wipe out every form of carelessness every form of super, uh, superficiality and every form of frivolity away from our lives in Jesus name take the fear of man away from our heart give us the clean fear of God and everywhere your people go your presence will go with them your power will go with them and everyone here everyone partaking with us at the Bible study will stand without compromise will stand fearlessly and will proclaim your word without fear without favor in Jesus name your gift of salvation your gift of sanctification your gift of the power of the Holy Ghost be for all your people in Jesus name keep on preparing us for heaven and when the Lord shall come my brother, my sister, myself all of us will see you on the final day will be with you confirm it Lord in Jesus' name we pray. Yeah.